Hello, Beatball World. Welcome back to yet another episode of the Beatball Blue Show. I've been looking forward to this. Not that this is going to be an exciting episode necessarily, but I do think it's going to be an awesome episode. And I, I'm, I've been proud to be part of putting it together. So I'm happy that we are finally getting here. I have a huge ensemble with me, so I'll run that down real quickly. Joining me once again, my co-host, my twin brother in life, Seth Bam Bam Clark. We finally now, people might not believe me because I've been pretending like she was going to be here from the beginning. I have the Facebook Live Queen, a dog finally in the house. I've got Andrea. I'm not sure why we brought this dude along. Nonetheless, we've got one of the Jet Life players along here with us. Demetrius Morrow has joined us and his former teammate from the Colorado Storm, Ethan Johnson, is also here. Um, really, Ethan Johnson is kind of going to be the focus of our show, despite uh, this large ensemble. And we'll dive more than uh, dive more into that. And I'll bring my co-host in, Seth Dahl. Welcome back, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well. Glad to be back with you and your great audience, Neil Dog. On this you first know, day of, of real beatball, right? Didn't we have a real beatball game today? Or am I I'd, on that? You know, you're right. The Edge and the Thunder played, but um, the la I don't know if they got an early game in or not, but the last I heard, all the games got called because of rain, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, uh, so I guess they're going to try again tomorrow. But it doesn't. They, look hey, they, they they can brave the COVID, but not a little rain. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that is an excellent point. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't make the decisions, so nobody nobody asks me. I'm just reporting the news, my friend. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm glad that you you came back and joined me again. Uh, I I like having you as a co-host, but I felt like. Uh, I might need you with this this uh, particular episode, as you've pointed out to people very freely. I'm an emotional person, <laughs> and, and and I think I'm gonna be all right. But I worried as I set this show up that it might be an emotional show for me. So I was like, man, I I think I need Seth Dog to be here this time, since you don't care about nothing. Nothing affects you. <laughs> you know, I I was thinking about that, and I was trying to come up with an analogy. It's like um. If we're using the, the present uh, political situation, you're more like Joe Biden while I'm more like Trump. I don't have that uh, that empathy thing going that, that you have. So I will I will be here <laughs> to to bring uh, pragmatism and uh, hard nosed analysis to uh, to our discussion. So we all I had, had absolutely no idea I'd ever in my life hear you compare yourself to Trump, and I'm well. I might, I might be in shock until the end. Although I got your analogy completely. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, people who know me know know my lack of empathy, and and I'm better than Trump at it, though. <laughs> at least I, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Honestly, in all fairness, it is kind of as far as your empathy goes. <laughs> it is a really awesome. Uh, uh, I, I'm not that you're not empathetic. But you don't right. show empathy. You don't show empathy. I know it's in your heart somewhere, but you don't right. show a lot of empathy. I don't so. show, no, I don't show it at all. <laughs> it's okay. Right. But yeah, so, I thought about that as a funny comparison. It's like you are, you know, Joe Biden. I'm Trump. <laughs> I liked our comparisons of like going with people like Augustus McRae and, and uh, Captain Call a little bit better than the two you went with. Though, to be honest with you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, for the audience to know, this is going to be a little bit heavier at times than, than any of the, the shows that have, have been here before. But, you know, not, it, not the whole thing, just parts of it. And I want you to stick with it because even though it's going to be heavy and some of it might be hard to hear, uh, the reason I want to do this is, is because it, it, it's beautiful, like in the end or whatever. You know what I mean? How things turned out. Um, and, and I don't know. We'll get more into that. All. I, I just want to ask, you know, people stick with it because we're, we're going to finish on a high note, even though some of this is going to be hard to hear. So enough on that. I want to make a quick introduction 
to again the Facebook Live Queen A Dog. Andrea, I'm glad you're finally able to join in with me. Thank you I'm for coming on to tonight. Finally. Oh, you like that little dog bark too. I don't yeah, know. that's A Dog. <laughs> <laughs> I planned that. When when exactly did you get your dog license? I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, you know. Yeah, I was actually going to, she probably doesn't even get what you're asking. I was going to point out the fact that, you know, when I started this whole thing and I announced that Andrea and I were going to be doing this show together, which was the, the plan from the beginning, uh, you know, like Seth and I have a history of like doing kind of trying shows together. We've tried podcasts, you know, similar type stuff. And, and we got the, this long friendship and beatball. So I'm doing a beatball show without him. He doesn't reach out to me about any of that. He's offended because I'm calling you a dog. He's like, a dog? Who's a dog? <laughs> there ain't no a dog. <laughs> That's from a long time ago. <laughs> That's what I told. She's always been my a dog. Yeah, I would say at least like 1995 or something. Yeah, you know, I I, I know, I know. I just, it just it, it just struck me. It was funny. I I was like, hey, dog, who, who is a hey, dog? But I'm all good. <laughs> I know the connections. I, I'm, I'm, Come on, I'm, Seth, now. I, I know the connections. I know. My history, my memory is good enough to know the connections. So. You have a partial dog license. I'll give you a pass. <laughs> give you a pass. Thank you. <laughs> Coming from a, you know, Bayou City Heat player, I don't even know why you would worry about it. Just kidding. Uh, kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but yeah, originally the plan was that, that Andrea and I would come on each week and we'd go on the Facebook Live together and hopefully people would be listening and asking questions and she'd be able to read the comments and it just never played out like that. So you might be wondering like why she's on now. Sorry, I'm constantly. So basically he's with using me for my site. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I was, but not, that didn't even work. So, you know, people might be wondering why now, because you're no use to me now. But, you know, for those that don't know, I, you know, I, I, whenever there's an elephant in the room, I don't, I don't like to dance around. I just like to come out in the open. But, like, for, like, 30 years, Andrea's had a huge crush on me, too. So, you know, I figured it'd be good enough time to bring her on the show. <laughs> All right. And he says that was my boyfriend on the show. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that was actually trying to be my humorous transition, but it kind of bombed out on me, to be honest with you. But the truth is, Andrea it ha has a better half, and and it was Andrea and, and, and this gentleman that hooked up this show for me. Um, so I thought it'd be a good time to have them both come on. But Demetrius Morrow, formerly of the Colorado Storm, now of the San Antonio Jets, I believe. Anyways, welcome to the show, Demetrius. What's happening, Demo? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, definitely, Jet Life. Jet life. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was Jet Life, man. You guys all over the place, free agents and stuff like that. I want to get some of your guys' money, man. I wish I was young. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Devo, before we, oh, we jump in, man, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you found your way to beat baseball. Um, I started losing my sight when I was uh, 14. And then um, a couple months before I turned 19, I came out to Colorado to go to the Colorado School for the Blind and my roommate was coming from the Massachusetts area and he had played a little b-ball out there um, and he was telling me about it and um, he knew that the um, they had a team out here and it just so happened to be 2003 when they had the World Series out here so we uh, hooked up with the guys and went out to the first practice and I was bought in it's uh I, it's it's always a similar story for us i think you know it's like somebody drags us in and then like anybody who's got like comp, you know competition in their heart especially for team sports which is something there's not a, a, a lot of availability to us uh you know it's like you just get hooked it's like oh i didn't know it could be like this right oh yeah yeah just yeah. i mean not even even playing a game just being able to play sports again um, cause you know, I didn't get to play in high school cause of the whole vision loss. So, right. Right. Being able to get back in sports. I did was like, I'm all in. Before, did you play sports before that? Like basketball, yeah. baseball, all those? Yeah. Yep. 
like organized just you know with yeah no I play, yeah. I play football played um baseball um organized as a youth and then you right. know just also playing in the neighborhood and stuff so yeah yeah what, what was your favorite to play what are your best at <sighs> um baseball actually i think that's kind of what really hooked me in the b ball like oh, i could i could play baseball again yeah nice you know it was uh funny when i was talking to you Devo. uh Seth, I think you'll get a chuckle out of this because, uh, you know, I, I, I was explaining to him, I was like, man, you know, I want you on the show and I'm going to, you know, we're going to talk to you and, you know, not ignore you, but, you know, I'm really like, like focused uh, uh, on uh, Ethan's story coming into this and I don't want you to feel like, you know, uh, you're taking a back seat or whatever. He's like, man, I, I've been taking a back seat to, to Ethan since I started playing beatball. And I laughed. I'm like, don't cry to me, man. I, I played next to Eric <laughs> in front of Mike Finn, next to Danny Papiano. This dude, Seth, had a nickname of Bam Bam when he was 15 years old already. It's like, man, I've been taking a back seat to all my teammates from the beginning. So, I, I mean, I feel you. But don't come nah, cry it, to me about back seat. <laughs> it, was, it, it was my fault. I had a good five-year run, and then I brought him to the game, and it was all downhill ever since then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that'll bring uh, us on to our. Uh, go ahead, Seth. You might ask. I'll just say I've something? always I've always prided myself in beatball and being a role player. So I've never had to be the the man like Neil and Eric. You know, I just I just play in the back in the background, and when I get a chance to do something, make my play. That's all, Neil. Dog. I, I've always said it was an honor and a privilege to play with you and Eric Mazariego. <laughs> <laughs> I, right. I would always tell Eric, and every every time we'd break before a game i we'd get in our little team huddle i would always say eric it's an honor and a privilege to play with you because <laughs> it is <laughs> eric was great but, but go ahead i'm sorry but when you guys talk about role players and right you know <laughs> play it just reminded me of, of my history of people so. demetrius you and i are brothers man <laughs> <laughs> so uh all right so uh, ethan as as i'm gonna uh bring you in now um you know, I uh, did a show with Seth a few weeks ago, and one of the things that came up, we were talking about, because it, it was it was the first show on YouTube, and I wanted to do a show like, what is beatball? And and Seth and I were talking about the tournament, because I really feel like the, the, the tournament is, is our big draw, that, you know, we like the game, but it's a tournament that sucks us in. And Seth made a really awesome point, because uh, our guest, Henry uh, uh, Wofford, Wofford was um, talking about how, you know, he remembers seeing players just like how much fight people team, you know, have. You play three games, you wear yourself out and get up the next day and do it again or whatever. And Seth made an awesome point that, you know, it's people players in a lot of ways start from the bottom. Like we, we became players because, you know, either lost your sight to a, a, a disease of some sort or, um, you know, you're in some kind of accident. Seth got shot in the face. I had a chain hit me in the face. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, players it, it find their way to our sport and they're, they are already starting from the bottom. So getting out and fighting on the, on the field is you know like I, like the easy part for a lot of uh, players in our sport and for me like as people hear the story uh, that Ethan's going to share with us he he epitomizes that in in so many ways and you know Seth I wanted uh, to bring up something because yeah you know, I, I mentioned when I had uh, uh, Lex on the show we were talking about you actually in our 2006 season and in you know, people that don't know Seth legitimately literally died and, and came back to life. His heart stopped for like two minutes that year. And so when, when Seth and I talk about the past, there's some things we, we literally refer to as before death and after death. And, and the BD, his memories, Seth, your, your memory, you know, your, is a little spotty or, or whatever. So I don't know if you remember this because it was right before that, but we, had, we we're both big fans of the Sopranos. And, um, uh, right as the show was getting to the end of its run, I had a conversation with you. As much as I love that show, it's like some of the violence in it was just turning me off. Like, I mean, not that I was ever turned on by the violence of that show, but it was just like it had gone too far for me. I don't know if I had right. changed or the show had changed, 
but it just wasn't working for me anymore. And one scene in particular um, was when Tony Soprano's son, AJ, got into college age. And he started hanging out with some guys who thought they were like little wise guys. And some, you know, somebody owed them some money. And they took this kid like out in the middle of nowhere and they poured acid on his, on one of his feet. And, and, you know, his toes ended up, he had got him amputated or whatever. And, and, and that was like one of the scenes that I was just like, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that turned my stomach. And I mean, what people are going to hear, this isn't, this is no TV show, right? I, I, you no. know, on to you. I mean, <laughs> sorry. You know what I mean? Cause, 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 people, people actually, I mean, we have the benefit of actually knowing what is, is, uh, is, is coming, you know, ahead. We know the story or whatever. I mean, I, I'm interested in the story because I, you know, as a historian and yeah. of, of slavery and stuff, it, 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 it has echoes, right? It, it, there's echoes here. Um, but, you know, to me, I, I always look at it and, and perhaps it comes from, you know, again, I, I would rather his story get out. And people are now like, huh, what, what yeah, are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. You got, you yeah, got yeah. acid on people's feet. And I yeah. hear you. I don't remember that scene at I all. I remember it, AJ right. and stuff like that. I don't remember that scene at all. But, um, I, you know, obviously it's an, it, it was, I can see where it would be affecting and stuff like that. So yeah, right. I, I'm, 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 I'm interested for him to, to unfold his story again. No, bring him on. Hey, well, so so, <laughs> um, so Ethan. Obviously, you told us your story last time, and I thought it. You know, you 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 are not from the United States, right? And so, I mean, maybe you can actually tell us. You know, the the context, the the the, the place you came from. Um, you know, your your the, the place you come has a, comes from has a rich history, right? Um, and so maybe you could just let a, let, let people in on, on where you were from, and kind of the, the 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 environment you grew up. In. Yeah, no doubt. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm from Ethiopia, uh, East Africa. For those geographically challenged like I am, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, got my hand up. Got my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But I know where I'm from, for sure. So, I mean, basically, I'm from, yeah, Ethiopia. I lived in a countryside and a grass hut. And, you know, lived in the same room as the chicken. It's one big room where you cook, you have your food. And, and you know, the chicken also live there. They have, like, a little perch. They go in there and they do their, you know, they go to sleep, get back out and do their thing. And if you are a boy, um you know, already learned to walk, then you get to, well, a boy or a girl, you get to do chores, basically, as soon as you learn to walk. And so if you're a boy, you get to learn how to watch cattle and, you know, let them graze around the mountains, the cliffs, whatever, and then bring them back before it gets too dark. If you're a girl, you go get water or wood for <clears throat> fire, or you go to the market, learn, you know, how to ch trade stuff and bring in what the family needs. So, uh, that was a life. So I was a shepherd boy, right in the in the rural community. So so it, it, it you know I've I've read enough um you know slave narratives from you know the the, the 15, 16, 1700s, I should say um, that describe being in Africa in that in that you know being in the countryside and mm -hmm. you know uh, you know boys or girls you know being off doing doing those sort of same things right cattle. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm not trying to say that, that, that Africa hasn't progressed, but different places progress at different times. Um, but, you know, one thing that in those narratives, it's always somebody is out and then some, uh, somebody grabs them, right? Somebody's out hunting for captives and they grab them. One mm -hmm. thing that struck me about your story is that's not what happened, right? I, I, as you were talking about, um, you know, being a shepherd and, 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 you know, all these things that, boy, I wish I could get my kids to do a tenth of, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I thought your story was going to go from there. I thought, you know, it was going to be something like that, but your story actually blew me away. What, what, what happened? How, how did you actually, um, get to a point where 
your site was taken, right? Yeah. Was, go ahead. Yeah, one day me and my sister were playing uh, with our toy, toys we made out of rocks and mud. We didn't have Xbox or PS4s or iPhones or anything like that. <laughs> no electricity, so you have to be creative with your time. So we had car toys, and then we made cattle out of mud. And I guess we're playing house. I don't know if they're like little kids play, you know, like uh, yeah. father and whatever that that type of game. And two guys came on a donkey from, oh, well, they said from the city, but, I, you know, being a farmer boy and we're not being educated, we didn't know where the city Addis Ababa was. But uh, they came and they started talking to my sister and I, and then my mom was in a grass hut making food and she comes out like, because she, she didn't recognize the voices. And she asked, who are you guys? And they said, hey, we're here to help kids in the village go to school in the capital city. And we'll bring them back every holiday so you can see the progress uh, after they finish school. And basically, you know, in the countryside, it's not really crime. So my mom didn't think anything of it. And mom wanted the best for me. And then they asked, who's the oldest child? And she said, it's Subalo. And, uh, and so my mom, like, says there's no crime. She didn't think anything of it. She's like, oh, that's cool, you know. There's a lot of times kids around 12, 13, they do arranged marriage and, you know, the guy, the 13 year old dude starts learning how to farm his land. And then the, the wife who's 12 or 13 starts, you know, producing kids so they can have a, a, uh, work team. Force. So yeah, <laughs> a team and, to and, uh, help on the farm. And, and your and, and so your mom actually, she's trying to do, kind of the right thing for you right I'm sure. yeah she wanted me somebody better than a farmer she wants me to be educated so because they told her you know i'm going to go to school and i can become something better than a farmer so she's kind of looking what, out for everybody this was the part when you were telling us the story the other night that i i didn't grasp grasp completely mm -hmm. at first i literally thought that these guys were offering to like take you in like 20 30 minutes into where a school was and at the end of the day bring you back home like i didn't realize how heavy it was as far as like you were going to be taking oh taken away like to boarding school basically you know what people that was a thought yeah. yeah yeah so basically they put me on the donkey we rode probably for a couple hours and spent a night in the city and the next early morning hopped on a bus about 12 13 hour ride and then we get to the capital city, Addis Ababa. And uh, we take a taxi and then they live in a jungle, like wooded area. And I was there a couple of days and then they said, well, uh, you need to get ready for school. And there was already people waiting there for us. And so one of them held me down by my legs, one sat on me, one held my arms flat on my back. And the fourth one put some chemicals. It's like cactus uh, juice, I don't know. Uh, it's like white. They put that in there. They put some other stuff in there. But um, you can flail like a chicken with his head cut off. The only thing they'll hear you is hyenas, and they're not going to try to help you out. They're trying to have a meal themselves. So um, three, four days later, I couldn't see anything. They hired teenagers to guide me in the streets, and uh, whatever I made, they would split it with the people that blinded me. And uh, yeah, that probably for a year or you seem like and um if if if, if i could just to, yeah go ahead jump well i just want to jump in and make sure people are clear on that because that was something mm -hmm. i like at first i i i i thought maybe it was some kind of punishment you know but it, I, people need to know this wasn't punishment this was their plan because yeah. sending sending you out as a disabled person earns more money right I mean, absolutely that, that's right. definitely their, their idea. Exactly. I mean, right. they want to disable you, disable you much as possible so you can earn much money as you can for them. And I mean, the thing is, it's not like they split it with you or they fed you. They didn't feed you. Um, the only way we were fed was people that didn't have money. They were selling bananas, oranges, or bread. They said, I don't have money, but I can give you some of this. Type of thing. That's the only time we ate. And so, wow. um, See, that's the, the thing that it's, it's like another for, form of unfree labor, slavery, right? They are, I mean, and, and this, and, I, and I've read about this um, 
previously that it, it and to me it you know to actually meet somebody who who's gone through it um to create i mean because because it you know it, it's kind of devious on on several different levels right because they know they can play off the 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 the, the public's um desire to want to help blind people mm -hmm. right and they can mm -hmm. play off the the public's the you know desires and just just to be good right um and but they are 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 doing it whereas it's another form of slavery right and so it's not that they're they're taking you out um and making you a, a sex worker or they're not taking you out and 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 you know putting you in into the field and making you a a, a slave like we're here in the united states for the most part um but to actually blind you so you could then play on the public's sympathies to get money to me shows a kind of a a a I mean, a level of, of, I don't even want to call it, you know, a level of, of, of sick. No, I don't want to call it sickness. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know what word you're looking yeah. for, but I, but I too have been blown away by the fact, not only that anybody was willing to do this, but they had a plan. This was a plan. You know what I yeah, mean? I mean, I wasn't the only one. So, I mean, they, 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 it was, it's been a practice for them. So, yeah. So how long did this go on for you? Yeah, I would say about a year or two. Uh, it's hard to keep track when you're just doing the same thing over and over and yeah, have no yeah, energy. So. Uh, but again, I mean, shit happens everywhere. Uh, it's not just in Ethiopia. I mean, no, that's just, true. I mean, I'm sure it happens here. It's just not knowing about it. I mean, you know, there's still child trafficking and all that stuff here, you know. And so, um, again, it's it's tough, but again, it's if you're lucky enough to make it out, you know, just be thankful. Cause I mean, I didn't think I would make it out. I didn't think I'll be where I'm at today for sure. I mean, it's just. So uh, talk about, talk yeah. about that. Talk, talk about how you got out. Yeah. And, um, and the people that got you out. For sure. So my thought was at that time, I thought I was going to be dying begging. Um, I didn't think I had a way out, but. One day I was in a coffee shop begging and I ran into a couple who ran a blind school in the city there. And um, the wife could see the husband was blind, but she must have told him I was coming in. They gave me 10 cents and they told my guys that they'd like to meet him tomorrow, same time, same place for lunch. My guides said, okay, sure, no problem. So we go back that night and the guides talked to the people that blinded me. They said, hey, we ran into these people. They want to meet us tomorrow for lunch. What do you guys think about that idea? And they said, hell no. Do not go back that route. It sounds, too, sounds too suspicious. If you go back that way, you guys are going to pay for it. So we didn't. the next day, we didn't go that route. We were, uh, we were begging somewhere else in a different city. But Ethiopian taxi is like a huge bus, and they don't leave until it's packed. So uh, we were on the bus, and... There, the bus was making a stop so people can get off. And the next thing you know, the couple got on the bus and they said, oh my gosh, you know, we've been waiting for you guys all day. Where you guys been? And my guide said, you know, we, uh, we forgot. We apologize. Maybe we can reschedule. The couple said, no, nah, you guys get off when we get off. And so we get off. The husband pulls out an Ethiopian dollar and said, hey, here's a dollar for a taxi for his parents. We'd like to talk to him, uh, talk to them uh, so we can help him go to school. And that's when my guides freaked out. I said, he doesn't have any family. That's why we're helping him beg in the street. Uh, and then my, the people that ran the blind school said, okay, well, in that case, we'll take him in. And then they had a tug of war. The uh, blind school had a security guard with a gun, and they chased him away. They brought me in. They told me, you learn Braille, and then if you do well, you can go to university and uh, be educated. But again, uh, there's a trust trust issue but i mean i i had no idea what's going on so he's just like okay sure and uh, about a week later they put me in a car took me to another countryside to go to go learn braille and i was learning braille for six months and then i had tuberculosis and they brought me back to the city and the hospital was actually full but the day before a family came and got one kid out of there so there was a spot for me so i go in there and, you know, a week later, a lady from the U.S. comes and says, oh, what happened to the kid that I was going to find a family for? And they told her, the doctors told her that 
all his family members came and got him. And so, but we like to introduce you to this kid. And they told her my story and she cried and said she would find me a family in America. And uh, me being a farmer boy, I had no idea, I had no idea what America <laughs> was. I thought it was a small town somewhere in Ethiopia I never heard of. And uh, three months later, get out of the hospital, they put me in an orphanage. And then about a year later, I get a letter saying that the lady found me a family and they already adopted 10 kids and I'll be first round 11th pick um, <laughs> to America. So it was, uh, how was that? <laughs> There, uh, there was a couple, couple things along there, like uh, um, especially after we talked the other night, that that stood out to me about all that. One mm-hmm. is first that that couple that with the with the blind husband that helped you. Mm-hmm. I I have to assume that put them in a little bit of a dangerous position to take that. Uh, uh, am I right? It, uh, or did did they know like with the people who had uh, blinded you? Oh yeah, you, they like, knew. They know. I mean, they deal with that all the time. So they knew what was going on and uh, I was definitely wasn't the only one for sure. But that, they, that's they knew really, what to expect. That's really brave though. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that's a, that's a very like inspirational part of this. There's a lot of inspirational parts for me um, on this, uh, including just your, your, your overall, uh, just your, your, just who you are, the, the person you are. But uh, you know, they, they, when people take a stand like that and do something that, that could put themselves in danger to do something right, that that's, that's so touching to me. Uh, and, and also though, that the family that adopted you, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if I'm out of line in saying this, but I, I have no doubt that I'm right in thinking that like here in the United States, a because at that time you're like eight to ten years old you know Mm -hmm. eight an eight to ten year old disabled black kid getting getting adopted like i would think you know the prediction would be maybe that they would probably be in like foster care and and spend more time at like state schools for the blind so for this family to like find you and know what you went through and to, to to bring you in like that that's touching to me too like all you know what i mean yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, straight to the point, I mean, they're not being supportive right now for sure. Oh, I think okay. I was a light, uh, I feel like I'm their black card, to be honest. Um, oh, that's just wow. the truth, especially what's going on right now. Okay. I'm uh, sorry. To be, I'm... Oh, no, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> black lives do matter. God damn it. But uh, <laughs> no, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, you know, it, yes, it, it, it's interesting to hear me. I don't want to take this in a different direction. No, but, you good. know, the. Uh, um, you know, the, 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 there is a lot of, let's say, almost tension or thought that Africans, when they come over here, don't necessarily consider themselves black or identify with the black community. But it seems like once you, you made it over here, you assimilated and, and, and identify fully with the, with the black community. Am I, am I reading that right? Ah, oh, that's another thing. <laughs> I used to. I, used to be <laughs> I mean, I knew. I, 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 when I, when I knew you were coming on, right? I, I, I was like, man, I want to bring this conversation up, but I was like, man, it might just take us in a different direction. But only when you brought up Black Lives Matter, I was like, okay, oh. I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out there. But if, if you can, go ahead. And no, absolutely. It. Are you kidding me? It's. Uh, I used to be scared of black people, so. Yeah that shows you what kind of raising I had. Um, okay. I grew up in Missouri and uh, my parents would say, oh, shut the door, shut, lock, shut, lock the windows, there comes black guys. And for Braille class, I would have to go to a bigger school, which was a lot of blacks there. And they just have them fun, acting wild, whatever. And, but again, because what I was thought, I was like, oh shit, they're gonna go after me or they're gonna beat me up. And then I didn't realize that uh, what was taught to me was negative and it was affecting me until I moved to Colorado. I'd be traveling, you know, looking for a bus stop and a bro would be like, a brother would come like, hey bro, where are you trying to go? Let me help you. I'd be like, oh shit, uh, I don't have anything. And, you know, I would not get his help, but I needed it. But again, because what I was taught, you know, that was ingrained in me. I was, yeah, you yeah. know, I missed that opportunity. And so, honestly, I mean, Demo is my teammate, but I kind of learned 
as I got older and got to hang out with them and like, oh shit. <laughs> What's happening to me is what my parents taught me. Yeah. And uh I learned that, you know, black people are not evil as my parents made it seem like. And, you know, I am black. I don't know what I what the hell color I was I thought I was at that time. I, or my parents <laughs> thought. So it's a hot subject right now, bro. It's uh, yeah. no, I, I uh, you know, I mean, I'm sorry that I. Oh no, I, you're like, good, man. I, I good. tripped down that road, but at the same time, like I, I like the. the it needs to be said. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I. Uh, I. You know. I'm not like I have any big stage here, but I'm not. I'll never shy away from the, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement. You know. I, yeah. Uh, I mean, I. You know, Seth. Seth's been my my. my no, I, I don't even really consider us friends. We're more like family, you know, for like 30 years or whatever. I, I yeah. actually, uh, a- Andrea and I had a conversation, which I assume she's perfectly fine with me sharing. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to bring that up. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so, I mean, we were talking a few weeks ago, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, pro- protests and riots and there's so much stuff going on. And, and she, she was saying like how, like she never thought of herself as racist or prejudiced or anything, but after, you know, being with, with Demetrius, she, she's learned, you know, things that, that uh, uh, seeing herself in a, in a, in a way when it comes to race that she wasn't even aware of. And, and I, I pointed out to her, it's like, she's kind of where I was 30 years ago. And it, it's not that I didn't care or whatever back then, but like, honestly, my friendship with Seth has educated me more than anything. You know what I mean? It's like things, me, you know, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is different for me now than it would have been 30 years ago because of not just my friendship with Seth, but the education. And and that came from our hours and hours of talks. And I was telling Andrea, it's like, you're not, you're not a different person now, but I'm sure you and Demetrius are having these same type of talks that Seth and I had years ago. And it's, it's educating, right, Andrea? Yeah. Yeah. It gives you a whole new perspective and um, definitely more understanding, I think, a deeper understanding of what you think you already know, but you really yeah, don't. Right. 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 No, honestly, that's why the biggest thing that really anybody just needs to try doing if they don't understand it, just just shut up and listen. Yep. Stop, ar- stop arguing <laughs> why, stop making up reasons, they shouldn't have done this or that. Shut up and listen. Like, I don't even want to talk that much in this regard, in this matter, because white people have talked long enough. Shut up and listen, me included. Yeah. So one more point. Uh, yeah. Again, being raised by my parents, uh, you know, you hear stuff, but you don't believe it because, like, oh, they're just making it up. And uh, again, I don't think people realize it unless they experience. So one day uh, here in Colorado, the Boulder Boulder is a huge race, and Ethiopian professional runners come here and race. And it's usually between them and Kenya. And that year, I think it was like in 2010, they won. And the race was like an hour away from where I live. So I was coming home, got the Ethiopian music blast, and I'm just, I'm okay. excited because I got to meet him, got to hang out with them. And, and so, next thing you know, I hear a police honking at me. And I was like, oh, it's not me. I keep going. He honks, he, he stops me. And he gets out and he's like, did you get in a car accident and start running this way? I'm like, what? Did you get in a car accident <laughs> and start running this way? I'm like, and the crazy thing is we had, I took this like uh, diversity class freshman year and I still actually talked to that professor because I just, we talk about like how it was, came in circle again because there was a lynching, I think it was like in 2007 or something, in Louisiana and we're talking about race. But anyway, she taught us, you know, as a black person, you have to react differently. You have to be polite as possible because you're going to use anything against you. And so if I didn't take that class, I guarantee you, this is what I was <laughs> like, am I blind or is, are you blind? Can you tell me that? Right. But I was just like, no, I'm blind. Here's my case. He's like, oh, um, somebody said uh, that looks like you was running this way. Right. And that's when I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. A big white yeah. blind king. Uh, yeah. yeah. We were just talking about that. That's what they always say. You look like the suspect we're looking for. Yeah. You fit the and description. Was, yeah. yeah you, you, you fit the description of somebody that we've heard about. Well, of course. Oh. And, and so no, that's what I'm I mean, saying. Unless you experience it, yeah. you don't realize it. Right. 
You don't yeah. see it. You, you just hear about it, but you don't really yeah. feel it. And it's like, yeah. oh man, you know what I see? It's like, man, you know, there, there there's fear, in, you know, involved. Man, when when cops approach you, yeah. and for a black person, man, it's not a comfortable situation. It's like, man, yeah. am, am I about to die here? Right. Yeah. I mean, and it's the real thought because because it really could happen just for for something stupid, man. Like, man, I you know I, I reached. Drop my cane, reach down and pick it up. Didn't know the cops were there and shoot me. You know, <laughs> it's like, man, yeah, this is so crazy, awesome. man. Yeah. So, but no, I, I, I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to get your perspective on that. Uh, oh, racism yeah. is a, a, you know, racism is a is a learned behavior, right? Yeah. People, people I think it's one one thing white people really don't understand. Like, never once have I had an interaction with a cop where I thought I might, you know, get beat up or right. killed right. or anything like that. It doesn't even occur to me. Right. Oh. Yeah, no, I, uh, I had I had a talk with a friend of mine. Um, I was kind of comparing his life to Seth's, really. Um, he goes, he's white, and he's got three kids. And um, some of the stuff here in Sacramento was getting really close to his house. And, you know, he and his wife were, were scared, and they didn't really understand or whatever. It's like... Um, you know, and I, I don't know what, I can't remember the whole conversation, but it, I, you know, I ended up telling him, I was like, look, you know, my, what my buddy Seth has to tell his three kids is so different than what you have to tell your three kids about being out in, in public. And I was like, and, and that alone is really what everybody needs to start understanding. Like black people aren't living by the same rules that white people are. And, and, it, and it's not right, you know, and, and, a lot of white people don't, I don't believe, really understand it. And, no, I, I, no, they really don't. The, the, as it relates to like my kids, you know, I, because we, we, you know, you've told them that, right? You, when, when you're with the cops, you can't run, you can't talk back. So I made them watch that last video out of Atlanta. So this is what happens when you run from the cops. They shoot you in your back, you get killed, right? And so, so but, but I'm sure most white parents don't have to do that right don't feel the the need to no. to show your your, your kids your your 9 11 and 15 year old kids somebody getting murdered so they know what not to do in in, in that situation you know and, and it's just and, a, and they're a really and they're, they're teaching it from a different perspective they're saying don't run from cops because it's wrong you're saying don't run from cops because it's going to get you killed Nope. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a it's such a different world, you know, that, that just needs to be acknowledged. You know what I mean? I'm not even asking the world to fix it right away, but let's try acknowledging it. Let's, let's just try to acknowledge it. That's a start, you know? <laughs> Uh, all right well now, right now that we've gone down the the true heavy that that now there was something extremely funny as i'm holding my earphones in the on the video tell us about your flight home uh, or, yeah, uh, 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 yeah, how, yeah, how you, yeah okay tell tell us how you got from ethiopia to the united states tell us about that and your experience yep. here. so after i got notified that i was going to get adopted um uh, there was nine of us i got out on a plane never been on a plane before and when i could see i saw it but i wasn't sure how people fit in there whatever but we get in the plane i thought that was the end of it honestly i thought i guess this was a suicide mission i have no idea what it was because the turbulence is crazy i never experienced that before but um i got a taste of great america when they gave me a big old slice of cake and a two liter of coke and i was like oh this america place is great it's <laughs> fattening you up <laughs> <laughs> and of course drinking a two liter of coke i had to go pee so the lady that brought us was named susan i was like susan susan shintibit which means toilet and she gets the stewardess and the steward takes me and puts me in the bathroom so obviously if you're a side of prison you can see where the piss mark was when you're blind you have no idea so it's like hmm what the hell do i do now and so back home for the most part if you're a guy, you just whip it out and just piss mark your territory wherever you like. Um, so I was like, well, maybe this is the way they do it here too. So I whip it out on the floor <laughs> and I get out. <laughs> I get out and Susan's like, how did it go? I'm like, oh, everything went well. Yeah. And then, so we go. <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So we get to, uh, we went from Ethiopia, Germany, Germany, Chicago, Chicago to St. Louis, and then St. Louis, we drove three hours to where I grew up, 
And the lady that found me a family was my fam with my family, uh, telling them when it's Suvalo to be it means toilet. So I have to go pee again. And my dad does the same thing as a stewardess does. So I'm like, oh, maybe this is the way they do it in America. They just do it in a room. So I whip it out, do it again. <laughs> and uh, finally, my dad's like, he grabs my hand, shows me the toilet bowl. He's like, toilet, toilet, shouldn't you be toilet? <laughs> oh, man. They're making it complicated. It's easier to just go anywhere you want. <laughs> you, you, and, set, uh, you set black blind people back like 50 years pissing on the board <laughs> and stuff like that you know uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the reasons the nfb protested that movie blindness because of stuff like that yeah <laughs> I, I never i never, never saw, saw the movie so yeah I'm not, I'm not in that mix and you know i i mean and it's funny you know I've had some some problems. <laughs> I've had some mistakes, and I, and I can't even say that. Hey, you know what? It's because I was from Africa. I didn't know any better. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could say that, but oh, it's always bad when you walk away from a bathroom with your shoes squeaking. <laughs> it's like oh, I missed that one. <laughs> uh, yep, so. so. So being that the show is a beatball show, let's kind of bring this all full circle and, and tie it into beatball a little bit. Unless you had something else you wanted to ask there, Seth Doc. Something else you no, we I'm, were I'm, leaving out? All right. No, oh, no, 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 no. I, <laughs> I have a personal interest question. Yes, just real quick. How many mm. other like blind and all, you know, I'm writing a dissertation on blind slaves, so I'll use the term. How many other blind slaves did they have working with you? We never interacted. They always kept us separate. Um, uh, by the sound, I would probably say 10 or more. Okay. All right. Because they, they thought that we always plot against them and figure out a way out. Right. Yeah. They kept us okay. separate. Because right. you always have to worry about all the blind people coming together and taking over <laughs> the world. Yeah. So I just point <laughs> that way and start running. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Right and off along, a cliff. <laughs> along along those same questions, something I was curious about too. Did did you know? I mean, you might not even know this because they kept you separate. But did they disable kids in other ways, other than I blindness? Have no idea. Okay, no, I no idea. All right, I probably don't even want to know the answer to that, really. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, man, thank, I mean, we're, again, we're going to dive into beatball now, but thank you for, you know, bravely walking us through all that. Um, I, I, I appreciate it. I think it's important for people to hear, not just to hear the story, but I, because your attitude is so strong, you know, you talk about being blessed this way, being blessed that way. And I don't think a lot of people would walk away from all that calling themselves blessed. So that, that's really what I want people to hear. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So far as that, I mean, honestly, everybody has a story and it's just what kind of supporting cast you have. Us, just, That's just the truth. I mean, uh, I was definitely blessed to come to Colorado Center for the Blind and, you know, connecting with D and other blind people because I didn't think blind people could do what they do now. I thought, like, I know. Okay, no, I had a... <laughs> I did, I did an article which I'll post at a different place, but I was like, because I assumed that blind people couldn't do anything because that's kind of how it was back home. But when I came to the center and seeing these fools crossing streets and grilling and pulling shit out of the hot oven, I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> how many eyes do you guys got? You know, it was, just, it was crazy. I was so impressed. And so if it wasn't going to the center and meeting B and then, you know, having uh, the Ethiopian community kind of carrying me along, I don't think I'll be where I'm at today for sure. So the key is you have to have a good wall to stand on for sure. Ethan, um, so, yeah, Ethan, says, Ethan says he learned a lot from me, but truthfully, I, I learned a lot from him. Like everything he's been through to be where he's at now, like you don't even know like how much strength that took and how much I look up to him for all the. I, I, uh, no, I totally believe that. And I, uh, I knew that by how quickly you were totally into doing the show, like the way we planned on it. You know what I mean? There's nothing selfish about it for you. You, you know what I mean? You're, you're there for your brother. And I appreciate that. Demetrius, man, tell, tell me about Ethan as a player. Talk, talk about it for our audience, man. Tell, tell us about Ethan, the player. Just, just gift it off the bat. First practice. You saw it, like, the speed was there. The reading of the ball on defense was there. Um, 
you know, he never really swung a bat, but we had to work on that. But even that came quickly. Yeah. Was that difficult, Ethan? Because, like, people who have never uh, really, like, seen, uh, uh, like, swing in the bat, I guess you had eyesight for a little while, but you're so young. Was, was that a difficult challenge to, to develop a swing? For sure, because we didn't have baseball back home. It was soccer that we made out of trash bags and stuff with paper and stuff. So the only sport I knew was soccer for sure. So I didn't learn about baseball until I came here. And uh, especially not to, not to listen to the ball and listen to your pitch. That was yeah, yeah, yeah. tough to adjust to for sure. But, uh, yeah. I mean, again, uh, I call D the general manager because uh, he's the one that drafted me. So. You know, it's it's his fault that I'm there, and it's uh, it's it's been a great fun times the last eleven years. We're teammates you now. We had to play against each other. So, oh, what, we'll what see what kind, happens. What, hey, what kind of game does he have? We know you're an all star. What, what what kind of you know? I don't really Probably. know anything about b-ball players. So tell me about this guy. You know, this, <laughs> you know tell me who, who who is this guy, man? He's got the power, and uh, definitely he plays the mid left, mid right. He's definitely versatile. He's a utility player. Um, and definitely willing to sacrifice for the team for sure. I mean, he played with one leg, was that three years ago? And, you know, some people would have given up, like, oh, I, I don't want to play. But he did, He takes. He does whatever it takes with the team, and um, he's definitely versatile. He plays whatever he's needed. So, uh, and leads with passion for sure. <laughs> um, leaving, out, leaving out the, uh, like, players that you are, you know, on your current team or players you played with, who, who are some players around the NBBA that you admire, Ethan? Uh, right now, I'd say Miguel. I just – I know he's a young cat. He plays on the Thunder, but I love his personality. He, he's it? too mature for his age. Miguel Tello. Okay. He's a – well, he is a – I think he's original second baseman. I just like his personality. He's, he just let his game talk. He doesn't talk, all, do all the trash talking as the young people do nowadays. But um, him for sure uh, – yeah, I hate uh, them. The, uh, in the old days, let me tell you. Uh, but, uh, hey, 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 these uh, little kids don't even talk trash now, man. Let, uh, let me uh, see. Uh, I hate, I hate <laughs> trash talkers. There's no place in the game for them. <laughs> uh, we're, we're definitely being, Vincent. Yes, we're being yeah. sarcastic. We're being all you are autistic sarcastic. people out there who can't <laughs> who can't tell the tone in our voice. Oh, okay. I know Houston. I know Houston. So that was all definitely right. one of my rivals. <laughs> Yeah, you guys so, eliminated us from a couple tournaments, man. I, you know, about time because you guys yeah. took care of us in 2008. That was my first year, and I was playing uh, deep left, and we had Arizona on our team. So I go left, and then Fonzie goes right, and I go right. Fonzie goes left. Like, <laughs> What's the point yeah. of this? <laughs> but uh, you know, everybody has their years. You know, make a run, right. and then new team comes around. So right. it's a circle of life. Uh, hey, Dima, what Fonzie about definitely went again? Would go away from you. I know that for a fact. So, yeah. go ahead. Neil Demo, what about you? Who who are some players you like around the league? That's not on my team. Yeah, you know, try to reach yeah, out. Yeah, somebody some, somebody who's actually won something. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, actually like I like I like um a lot of the guys from the Titans. I like what the Titans are building. Um I like uh Lamont. I like Lamont game. He Started uh, like 2014, um, and just watching his game grow, you're gonna. When it all comes together, and now that they have dedicated volunteers and all that, I think you're gonna see some special come out of there. Andrea, you got anybody you you like checking out on the field besides you know <laughs> the besides the animal that was just talking. <laughs> you know, but but hey, she, Andrew, why don't what? you take it far, farther back, right? I mean, you're you're as you know. Yeah, she's been around. You're forever. you're you're been as you know. I I can remember standing in the hallway with you in, in 1990 or whatever, right back yeah. when we were teenagers. And yeah. so, who 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 are the great players that you've seen, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, perhaps there's some I mean, biasness, but you've seen all of them, right? So, you, so yeah, is, back then, of course, um, you know, the Austin Blackhawks had their run and. They had so many good players, and so that was really how I got introduced to the game. 1989 was the first time I ever saw beat baseball, um, and I think uh, Albuquerque True Sight was still a team then. And then of course, yep, yep, yep. And then of course the Dogs. 
Oh. Um, <laughs> well, so? In the heart. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm so terrible for remembering specific details and names, but there are a lot of great players that I've seen throughout the years. It's funny. I, I, I actually was going to, I don't know why I'm doing it now because I decided not to throw you under the bus like this. But <laughs> I, I was, uh, I was going to tell you to, to name off some of your favorite players only. I was going to tell you, you can't name uh-huh. anybody from teams you've been associated with. Uh-oh. You can't name any family members. <laughs> and you can't name anybody you've been romantically involved with. And I was thinking, man, that might narrow it down to like the women of our league. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, Neil. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. At least got Seth to laugh. Demetrius yeah, no. kicked my ass. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Oh, don't worry about Demetrius. You know, we hung out with Demetrius a couple uh, two years ago. I think it was in Wisconsin. Demetrius and Andrew were in the heat room, man, and. And I won't lie, Demetrius sounded nervous, man, like we were going to beat him up, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> you, you ain't got to worry about him, man. You ain't got to worry about him. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a silent assassin. I was just assessing the room, making sure, you know, where my ex- escape areas were, you know. <laughs> okay, I, 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 thought you were, I, I thought you were nervous, but you were just checking out the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't let that. his quiet nature fool you. S- size, <laughs> size of things up. So, man, I want to finish up uh, our, our beatball stuff by talking about Johnny Walker. I know you guys each uh, got to play with Johnny with the Storm. I wanted to tell a story about this, dude. Because, you know, when I had uh, JT Herzog on the show early when I first started doing this show, I, I, start, I didn't finish my thought, but I started talking about how there's some people in the league who are beloved by their teams. And there are some people in the league who are just beloved by everybody. And, and Johnny Walker, it certainly falls in that category. In, in 2004, when the Stockton Stingrays went to their first ever tournament, um, Colorado wasn't there. And John, John Walker had shown up just to be like a volunteer. I don't know if he was going to umpire. I, I don't know exactly what he was doing. I don't know if he had a plan to help out a team already. But, you know, Stockton, and again, this is their first t- tournament ever. They get to the airport the day they're flying out and find out their pitcher's not going. And, and their pitcher wasn't even that good to begin with, but they, they had no pitcher. They're going to their first tournament. They, they literally land in Ohio. I think that, yeah, Columbus, Ohio. And they don't know what the heck they're going to do. Johnny Walker finds out about this. He takes them out for like a six, eight-hour practice. He's pitching to them. He taught them how to play defense. He took it like he coached their team through that entire tournament. Does any part of that surprise you guys about this dude? Actually, actually, no, but I got to correct you a little bit. What? That was uh, 2005 in Houston and because I went with Walker to play with that Stockton team. Wow. And uh, – so like, I'm, not usually, I'm not usually wrong, D. I don't know big <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've actually never known Neil to be wrong in the entire 30 years that we've Yeah, been. yeah. yeah. So, so, I'm going to I'm gonna have to have Frank Porter edit that out of this. <laughs> 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 All right, so go ahead, man. Go ahead. Tell it. 2004, we went as a Colorado team. That was my second okay. year. So 2005, um, they did lose that pitcher right before the World Series, but it was a couple of weeks because I was at home in St. Louis on the 4th of July weekend, and I wasn't actually going to the World Series because Colorado wasn't going as a team. But Walker called me up, and he's like, you want to go to the World Series? And I was like, with who? And he told me about Stockton and that situation, and he said he was driving. I was like, well, we're doing a road trip. I'm all in. <laughs> um because road trips with Walker is something totally different. Like, <laughs> you never know what you'll learn or what you'll get into. <laughs> so we drove from Colorado, meet him and Ron Watson, all the way to Texas. Um, and that week we played with Stockton. Yeah. The the thing about the practice was right. We took him out and did a super long practice with him, kind of taught them the rules of the game. And, yeah, it went on from there. It was a great week. Like I had a lot of fun playing with Stockton that year and helping out, helping them out, helping them, introducing them to the game. That's actually way we're kind. Of, I don't know if we lost him on the Wi-Fi, but that, that's actually way cool. I had no idea D D played with them. 
I, I, I don't even remember the year. It took. I, I'm sitting here r- racing through my mind. It's like, God, 2005, yeah. 2005. That, I was like, oh, I remember. Yeah, Houston. <laughs> I remember. It, was, it was in Houston. It was in Houston. It was in Houston. The first time I ever got an unsportsmanlike penalty. I, I, I was proud of that. Is Oblo, you got anything to say about Johnny Walker? Yeah, um, Walker, I mean, like you said, that's what he does. I mean, he sacrifices whole family for people. I mean <laughs> – yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I love, like D said, I love his road trips because you always learn something. You always got stories and uh, always entertaining. And he never made us feel like we're blind. He always treated us like one of his right. people. And, you know, if we're going inside to guide with him, you always got to be prepared because he's going to do some crazy stuff. Once once in a while, he'll go <laughs> lean down. You're thinking you got to line a whole bunch of blind people behind you. Thinking you're going downstairs. You squat down. Everybody's shuffling yeah. and scared. That is and so he's, funny. <laughs> he's <laughs> crazy. Uh-huh. He's a great person. One of my closest friends growing up, Andy Brocchini, used to do that same thing to me. He always did it um, like at movie theaters when we go to a movie. Because, you know, coming out of a movie, there's usually a lot of steps and ramps and stuff. And yeah. he would do that in front of hell of people. Like, to, like squat all down. I got my foot <laughs> out looking around for the step, you know. <laughs> kill me with that. Just kill me with that. All right, so, uh, look, man, I, I appreciate everybody being part of this very much. This is, uh, for me personally, this has been a very special uh, episode that I've been proud to be, be, be part of. Um, Ethan, when we, when we talked the other day, um, you, you said something that I thought was really beautiful about your country. And um, I don't know, just being around you this week has been a gift to me. So I'm going to try to give a gift back to you that uh, I want to take your words and, and turn it into a beatball gift for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm kind of tying two things together. And I don't know if I have you characterized as a player real well. Um, so I apologize if I don't. But um, – so first, the, the thing you said the other day, you were talking about Ethiopia and how beautiful you think it is as a country, and it's because of the way all the people share with each other. And the yep. example you gave, you said, man, if there's a million people in a room and there's only one crumb, that million people, they're going to share that crumb. And, and you know, that, that, that's a beautiful thing to say about your people. I, I can't say that about the country I come from. Um, so that, that's a beautiful thing to say. But so where I'm going to try to tie this in is in David Wansick's book, um, mm-hmm. he describes a play where the ball got by you and he's describing you as laying there like punching the ground because <laughs> you had missed the ball, right? Yeah. So – I need you, not not just you, but Demetrius, Seth. All I, I know Seth doesn't even know where I'm going with this, but I know he's going to agree with me just from because we 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 run teams on the same philosophy. Um, it, so and this isn't just for you guys. Like every coach and every player, and really every sport could could take this and and apply it. So going forward, you need to look at that ball as a crumb. And all the players on the field with you is your country. Don't like when you miss a ball, don't sit there punching the ground because you didn't get that crumb. Be happy that your teammate behind you is going to get that crumb. Like they get to eat today. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know you are I know you're not doing it to be selfish, but really yeah. my point, my point is like in beatball to be a good defense, you have to communicate. And when you're in the front line of defense, you have to let the person behind you know what's going on. And the reason I recognize this is because this was a big problem for me. And yeah. I, didn't punt, I didn't punch the ground. Instead, every time I missed the ball, I started cursing like a sailor. And, <laughs> and at, at some point once Don Robinson took over our defense and more, more importantly took over like coaching me directly, he, he made it clear that's unacceptable. Like, you know, because I wasn't communicating to my players behind me what was going on. I was pissed off that I missed the ball. Even yeah. if I wanted the ball to help my team, you know what I mean? It was self-absorbed for me to uh, do whatever. I remember when Don started telling me, it's like, you can't, you, you know, you got to communicate to your teammates and Seth and Eric are laughing like, well, we kind of know what he means. It's like the same thing. as <laughs> <laughs> But you know what I mean? It's like, don't, don't waste your energy punching ground. Be happy that you're, you're, your fellow countrymen, or, you yeah. know, your teammate is going to get that crumb. Even if it's like, you know, 
to me. Oh, you've never, you never, I, play, I, you never I, played I, Colorado. His teammates weren't getting those crumbs. Oh, they weren't yeah. getting no crumbs. Come on, oh, man. You no, got no, it by no. Ethan. It was all good, man. Uh, Start no, walking. No. Yeah. Yeah. Even, I, uh, even, even if Demetrius is behind you, you know he ain't going to eat. You still got to believe in your teammate. I'm just uh, no. I'm just I uh, believe in my team. Playing behind, playing behind Ethan gave me the chance to actually, I can actually play defense because as great as he is, there was a lot of crumbs to be picked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, oh, shot, fired. It's all good. No, I usually communicate. <laughs> I usually punch the ground yeah. afterwards. I say, buy right. me, but I'm mad as buy me, though. I should have had that. <laughs> well, yeah, I agree. Like, Shane's caring. Like I said, I, you know, I didn't know if I was calling you out in a fair oh, no, way just off, off a couple lines in a book. But like I said, I also believe it's something that all the players need to know. You know, we've all heard players out on the field going, ah, you know, F, because they missed the ball or whatever. It's, you know, communicate to your teammates. It ain't about one individual. We're out there as a group. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. it, again, I want everybody to take that point. Not, you know, I'm not, not trying to come down on you, my friend. No, you gotcha. just made you just made me a great show, so you know. He's gonna, he gonna miss me. He's <laughs> <laughs> he gonna, he gonna miss me playing behind him. No doubt. Yeah, one thing I like about D, I mean, he's always there. He's always in the pocket. So that's, you have to have that as a mid right. I mean, excuse me, mid left when he's behind me. So it's a, it's a communication thing for sure. Indeed, indeed. Everybody, thank you so much, Andrea. Thanks for coming on. I'm glad I finally got you on here. Did you have fun? <laughs> Yeah, it was fun to listen to everybody. Thank you. No, thank you. D, how you feeling, man? Do you have a good time? Yeah, yeah. It was a good show. Awesome. I appreciate that. Ethan, man, you I mean you're a beautiful person, dude. I, I you know, I hope uh hope hope we developed a friendship this week because I uh I'd like to keep you in my life, dude. You're you're a good man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Like I said, you know, it's just uh great supporting cast. It's not possible without having those supporting cast for sure so thanks for that's a case for all of us right yeah. that's a case for all of us right we all we all need the help Seth yeah. Dog, any, any closing yeah. thoughts well i mean as he as he proves as you prove as we all prove you know there the the idea of even a tragedy is 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 uh is is overblown right you, you don't know in the moment what that experience is going to lead to right if he doesn't go through that He's not here in America to play in baseball. Absolutely. So, so there, there, there's, you know, I, I always say it's, you know, you got to be lucky and unlucky, right? We're, we're, yeah. we're lucky and unlucky all at the same time. You got to be willing to let things play out before you actually, um, you know, judge how any one um, um, event, you know, it, it, whether it's a, a, yeah. a good thing or a bad thing. So um, I've appreciated it. Um, Ethan, all the, the answers you've had, you know, all your answers have been extremely fascinating for me. Um, I hope at some point I can, can reach out and get more uh, information from you. Um, the, you know, both of you guys talking about starting in 2003 in Colorado, you know, it, 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 it that, that year hits my heart. That was the last year the real dogs ever played together. I remember that, that, that tournament with, 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 with sadness and, and, and it kind of makes me smile to, to think that you guys think of it with, uh, with joy or whatever. It's just that the different, the different ways our, our sport, um, affects us. So. I've enjoyed it. Andrea, nice to see you. A dog, I should say. <laughs> A dog in the house. So, I'm sorry. I'm all leaning forward. So there you go. Neil Dog, thanks for having me. And Mike and Jack. Of course. Of course. Ethan, I always like to finish off my show by saying goodnight to actually it's Seth's Aunt Cindy. I always finish the show by saying goodnight to Aunt Cindy. I was wondering if in your native tongue that you could both wish her sweet dreams and say goodnight to Aunt Cindy. <laughs> Salam dirty, I can stay Cindy. It didn't sound as sexy as I was hoping. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, Neil. <laughs> uh, never, nevertheless, give it to us one more time. White. <laughs> okay. And I'm Daddy Akaste, Cindy. <laughs>